Thank you, Kim. And uh, I'm going to move this. I think that'll help a little bit there. I am so thankful for today and what this means. If you have been a part of UPC for very long, we have a tradition now at the end of June where we gather together corporately, the entire church, in one service and celebrate and remember the good things that God has been doing in our midst and in and through our community. And friends, we have so much to celebrate. We have so much to be thankful for. God has been faithful, and you have been faithful to the work of the church. And we have uh, so much to celebrate in light of that. I want to thank you, friends. I want to thank you uh, for being a partner in this ministry and this call that we have as a church. I want to thank every person here who is a mission partner in this community. Every conversion to faith, every baptism, every Bible study, every child and family who is fed through our food bank partnership and through our local partnerships with uh, YFC and Young Life and our international work with Cherish Maru and our work now in China and Veronish, Russia. Every ministry happens because of your faithfulness. There's nobody else. There's no other room of people that are gathering right now to make that ministry happen. It is the work of this church. It is the work of you as the body of UPPC that makes that happen. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I also want to do something that I don't know if I've heard this before, but as, as your pastor, I want to say thank you for your giving. You have been faithful. We have uh, much to rejoice in in terms of the stewardship of our congregation. Jenny and I know firsthand how difficult it is to give that first fruits tithe to God amidst all the other things that are pulling on you, the financial tensions, and yet this church is so faithful to the ministry and call that God has put on our lives. We have so much to be thankful for. I want to share sort of a celebratory state of the church today, and my prayer is that we'll all leave encouraged. And uh, perhaps even you'd leave with a few questions that you'd like to ask an elder or even if you'd like to set up a time with me or Pastor Taylor um, in this reflection. Uh, First, I'd like to reflect on the last seven months that I've been senior pastor of this great church. So many of you have been supportive of me and my emphasis on the gospel of Jesus Christ as the anchor of our life together. Have you heard that? Has the message come through? Our series on the Gospel of Mark and subsequently on the continuum strategy that we will be employing in our ministry priorities all point to the strong conviction I hold that each of us must grow in our discipleship. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we must grow in our discipleship to follow Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All of the sidetracks and the diversions, all the conflict that seeks to divide us is powerless in the face of Jesus Christ. It is powerless in our collective unity in Christ. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can be faithful to Paul and Christ's desire for us to be unified in one body. As I mentioned in the letter uh, that came in the bulletin this morning, Our collective unity in Christ is one of the most important and beautiful images in the New Testament. As evidenced, certainly, in our passage today that Kim read for us. Through his body, through the body of Jesus Christ, the church, you and I, are united. We have been united with Christ. We're not just imitators of Jesus. We don't just model some good teacher We have been engrafted into Christ. We are now a part of Jesus himself. And all of our collective differences fail to make a dent in the overwhelming power and reality of our collective unity as a baptized community in Christ. Lean into that, friends. Mature your discipleship. Hard days may be coming for the church of Jesus Christ in the Western Hemisphere. But Jesus unifies us in his body, and it takes a mature discipleship to remain rooted in Christ's body. This is why I'm so excited to announce our church theme and emphasis for the next year. The emphasis will be these words, faithful to our calling. Faithful to our calling. 
All this next year, we're going to be considering what does it mean to be faithful to embodying the love of Jesus starting this summer. But next uh, fall, we're going to be starting a series, an in-depth study on the book of Acts. I'm so jazzed for this. It's hard to, it's been hard to keep it in, but uh, we're going to be uh, focusing on that book uh, for a good part of next year. And the theme of it, the title of the sermon series will be Gathered and Sent, an in-depth study of the book of Acts. Cultural theologians are in agreement that as Christians today in our culture, we have more in common with the first century church than at any other time in church history. And we're going to learn from the holy text, the book of Acts, of what God intends the marks of the church to be and how the witness of the first Christians changed the world. And as a result, you and I are sitting in this place, this church, UPPC, because they passed on the faith to us. I want to invite every small group to engage in this study with the resource of N.T. Wright's work on the book of Acts. It will be available to you later on this year. We used the same uh, study uh, in our Mark series earlier this year, so many of you will be familiar with it. But I want to challenge you uh, to engage in that as a small group. It will be a very rewarding study, and you can get a hold of that in August here in just a, a few weeks, if you can believe it. Uh, as I further reflect on the, the past seven months, I also want to uh, just acknowledge, I, I, I know that there is anxiety with some in our midst as I talk about, as we've been talking about, the future. And there's been anxi- anxiety about what that means for the things you enjoy and appreciate. And sometimes anxiety can result in, in mishearing, maybe even mischaracterizing. Uh, I will not be changing the traditional service. Uh, some of you may not know this. The traditional service is actually kind of our bread and butter. Um, it would be like 7-Eleven doing away with Slurpees, right? <laughs> this is who we are. Uh, our traditional form of worship, as many of you know, Jay and I worship together at the traditional service. doesn't mean it's, we think less of the 11 o'clock service, but we love uh, the traditional service. And uh, I know some folks think when we celebrate and we join together all the musical gifts, that somehow there's an agenda behind that. There isn't, except for wanting to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. Right? And uh, so, yes, that's, that's worthy of a, a welcome. There is no, there's no secret agenda. In fact, most of the changes, really, that we're talking about have to do with the way that we're employing ministries into the future outside the walls of the church and the kind of energy that requires, okay? But know that I am focused on lifting up Jesus and the burden to share Jesus' love with those in our community. I don't want this church to be the kind where... Members are the only beneficiaries of the ministry of this place. That would be a distortion of the gospel. Instead, you've heard me talk quite a bit about members as missionaries. Those who hold the mission of the church embody that mission and see the fruits of that mission. You've heard me say that when we place personal preferences for decor or furniture or drums... Whatever it may be, if we place those personal preferences ahead of kingdom purposes, we are in real trouble. It's a deceptive form of idolatry, friends. And ultimately, all idols will seek to destroy the unity you have in Jesus Christ. This is why I'm so strong against protecting the idolatry of stuff. We protect the mission that Christ has given to us. I feel the same way uh, about the Presbyterian Church USA, our, our denomination, and presenting issues these last several years, this idea of preserving unity. As members of the broader church, we are unified in Christ. We're unified by a theological and ecclesiastical tradition. It's a tradition that shaped me and brought me to this place to be able to serve in such a way as your pastor. That unity is being tested by differences around same-sex marriage. You may have heard some events this week uh, are going to be challenging a lot of how some people see marriage in general. Certainly for some, it was around ordination standards. As a few of you know, there are some churches, even some of my friends and colleagues, who have left the PCUSA. And some people have even asked why I stay in the PCUSA. And I share with them three reasons. It's really simple. At least it's simple to me. It's something that God has 
has worked over in me over these last uh, several years. First is humility. I stay because of humility. I don't know all the answers. While I'm on the conservative theological side, I should really say that that's a nuanced word, conservative. It's more orthodox. I'm on the orthodox side of denominational conversations. I have to tell you, I still struggle. I could be wrong on a good many things. As brilliant as I am, (laughs) I have not arrived at complete knowledge, and I continue to learn from UPPC members from all positions across many different perspectives. There are many here in our pews every Sunday who have very different perspectives. If we focus on our differences, we, we cease to be unified in Christ. If we focus on Christ, we will be unified. I continue to study scripture, read articles and books from positions that are different from my own. I stay because of humility. The second one is that I have a, a caution and uh, sensitivity to the notion of schism. Even though I was not in favor of, of consecrating same-sex marriage as holy, which is altogether different than the secular realm's understanding of marriage, I am not planning on exiting a denomination which allows such marriages. A theologian once said that the only reason for schism is when a pastor is no longer able to exercise his or her conscience and preach the gospel. Neither have happened, friends. So I have a caution with schism. And the third is freedom. Pastors and individual churches in the PCOSA have tremendous freedom from outside control. Our own Presbytery of Olympia leadership has been supportive of me and welcomed my prophetic voice and allows UPPC to follow Christ in the way that we discern best for us. We have freedom. So friends, know that as your pastor, I still feel that I can follow my call to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ right here at UPPC where I am. And in Paul's words, in our passage today, I believe I can live a life worthy of the call I have received in this place. Now, whether or not the PCUSA's uh, ability to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace is actually occurring, that's up for debate, and there's going to be a lot of talk about that in the coming years. Much of it we don't have much control of here at UPPC. It may be a stretched peace, but I choose peace nonetheless, to and for the glory of God. On March 22nd of this last spring, I shared the posture to which I want us to take when we discuss difficult issues such as gay marriage. I shared then the question of deeper importance than what's our stance, right? Which is a defensive, kind of aggressive, this is my stance. I'm I'm standing against something, which has divided churches ever since the first century. Rather, the greater question for UPPC is, what does mature discipleship look like in the face of a contentious issue. This is what has sustained the church over the many years of its existence. You know, during the Reformation era, they killed people for baptizing uh, out of line with the church. The church lived through that. It learned through that. We can learn through this new wave of controversy. The question for us is, what does mature discipleship look like in the face of a contentious issue? Are we able to not succumb to the culture's pressure to make it my way or the highway and work hard to cherish and protect the unity of the church for which Jesus prayed and Paul championed? Unity that is key to the church's evangelical task, the task to love people the way that Jesus is calling us to love them. I shared that... uh, uh, back in, in March, that we're going to address this amendment as a congregation, but before we do, we all need to take uh, some time to, to maybe learn a more mature posture as a congregation before we can be open to learning and talk with each other in the spirit of Paul's words today is when he says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Today at the Connect Center is an information sheet on a four-week roundtable class I'll be facilitating in September entitled Gay Marriage, the Bible, Culture, and the Church. It'll be a a limited enrollment for this first wave of the class, but it's open for registration starting today on our website. 
And if we have enough engagement, I'm hoping we can, we can do it again and uh, maybe add more classes. But if you're interested in participating, uh, the information sheet will be available at the uh, Connect Center. And it's going to tell you a little bit about some of the requirements for it. If you can believe it, there's actually going to be homework. We have to learn how to talk. You have to learn what maybe the other side of, of the uh, conversation has to say before you can uh, offer up your own perspective. And I have some expectations for how that will be done. But uh, I found that, that contentious issues tend to be compounded by ignorance and a lack of study. Okay? And I'm not just saying that from one side. I think it's uh, uh, from many different perspectives. I'm okay with someone's convictions as long as they're, uh, they're informed. Okay? I know that this will be a challenging and engaging uh, class. It's going to involve roundtables. Uh, why that format? I believe and feel it's my, my guiding philosophy as your pastor that I take a strong position on Jesus and the authority of Scripture. And all other issues I prefer, we prefer, I think as a leadership, I could say, we prefer to have conversations. Hence the roundtable emphasis. Because how the lordship of Jesus Christ and the authority of Scripture gets worked out in the complexity of our lives requires relationship. Requires talking to people, especially if it's someone who you may be in disagreement with. Okay? So, take advantage of that after the service if you'd like. Pick up one of those uh, sheets. If you're not interested, that's fine. We're not going to hold the whole church uh, to that. But uh, if you're wanting to be a part of it, please sign up and uh, be a part of that experience uh, with me next fall. Uh, I want to transition just to some good news around staff. I'm going to bounce around on a couple different things here. Uh, Last year at this time, I became aware of our former worship minister, Jeffrey Meek's call to another church. And it put us into a, a position where at the end of August, we were now starting a search uh, for our new worship ministry. I'm so excited that Diana Green uh, begins her ministry with us starting this next Wednesday, the 1st. And God is so good to us in bringing Diana here to our congregation. I know you will be uh, a part of welcoming her in. But uh, it's also time, it's appropriate, to thank all those who stepped up in the interim to lead our worship teams. Uh, first, I'm thankful to Joel Westgard who has been leading our orchestra these past 10 months. Will you join me in thanking Joel for his service to our church? Yep. Yep. And of course, our, our beloved director of worship, Keith Loftus. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Come on up. Keith, come on up. We jumped the gun a little bit there, but that's great. Uh, I want to invite Darla McNeil up too. And uh, it can't be, it really cannot be overstated what a gift you are to me and to this congregation. Thank you for your leadership and passion in directing worship of our church these last 10 months, and particularly in your passion in directing the choir. I know Darla has a few words. I'm going to give you the microphone here, Darla. And uh, yeah. One of my roles. Would you want to come over here? You come over here. Yeah. One of my roles in the choir is to help with communications. So I sort of feel this morning that I can speak for our choir. Um, And we're so grateful (laughs) for Keith's ministry as our esteemed leader. He's displayed humility and kindness as well as spirit-filled, insightful leadership with great communication skills and plenty of fun thrown in. (laughs) As he steps into ministry with Dr. Green, we have a couple of gifts for him something new and something old. In this sort of new gift bag, we have our personal good wishes for Keith, for him to take home and hopefully ponder and know how we feel. Yeah, great. The old thing we want to give him is something we've been keeping warm for him, 
and it's his chair <laughs> in the choir. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you. Dallas, stay up here. Thank you. Uh, friends, uh, Keith is not going anywhere. We get to enjoy his gifts uh, well into the future, but he stepped into a, a, a pretty big role this last year, and I want to just uh, pray for him, a uh, prayer of blessing. Will you extend a hand forward real quick? Let's, uh, let's pray. God, thank you for Keith's gifts, and we know he took on a, a lot of responsibility this past year. I'm excited to see how he's going to continue to flourish with uh, that ministry partnership with Diana, and to go back to, I know his his uh, passion for artistic uh, work and raising up the artists in our own congregation to serve our worship and our life together. And so, Lord, thank you for him. Bless him this day that he would know what a treasure he is in our church. And we pray this in your name and everyone said, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. I also want to just acknowledge briefly uh, the leadership and gifts of Heath Hollinsby, who joined our staff last November and has helped our contemporary worship flourish. As you well know, not everyone uh, finds one particular form of worship uh, their deal, but we've really experienced some growth and vitality to our contemporary worship. You've heard him as a vocalist in many of our key services throughout the year. It's such a blessing to have him and his family be a part of this church. Can we thank uh, Heath Hollinsby, who's right back there? Many of you know Pastor Taylor and Ruth Olson, even Taylor Conrad, who's our mission minister, who actually, they're on the road right now. I was able to pray with the the team just at 9 o'clock before they left on the youth mission trip, so um, they're on the road right now on their mission trip. But both Ruth and Taylor, um, Morgan and Taylor Conrad, all absorbed some of the duties of the executive pastor role that we chose not to backfill. And you may not know that since 2008, every single minister in our church has absorbed a full-time position. We've been trying to be very uh, conservative and shrewd with our staffing, and these folks work incredibly hard to serve our church. So not only for Ruth and Taylor and Taylor, but for all of our staff, can we thank you for them for their service to our body and their diligent work? There's so much, so much to be thankful for, and I am blessed every day to work with such a dedicated staff. I want to just briefly touch on, uh, I'm coming to a close here, so don't worry. Uh, Session and and our visioning work. Your Session is an incredible group of people that are dedicated to serving UPPC in so many ways. And the past three years have required a lot of hard work and faith and perseverance. I think it's fair to say, and just receive this for what it is, I think it's fair to say that they're underappreciated. I don't mean to say that we should feel bad about that, but I don't think we do a very good job of lifting up and honoring our elders and praying for them. I really mean that. And I challenge you to honor and encourage them at every opportunity. They are working hard, very hard, to change the notion of transparency, to be available to you as evidenced by the monthly Q&A sessions in the library and regular reports on what's occurred in the session meetings. They are open. They want to lead with integrity and in clarity. Additionally, we've been talking a lot about the threefold task of governance that the session is charged with. Something that you all that have been a part of here for years know uh, and have great trust in is that, and Reed, can you put that up? Is that we're really good at the fiduciary uh, side of leadership, but any uh, work of the session has to hold all three in tension. Fiduciary is the running of the church, protecting our uh, assets and stewarding well our budget. But then there's the strategic side, which is how do we strategically lead people towards full discipleship in Jesus Christ? I'm excited that you're seeing some of that visibly in our congregation through the continuum. This is work we're doing on our session and through several key teams. But the side that most churches really don't do a very good job in, that we've really tried to lean into these past several years, is the generative side. How do we generate new responses to the kinds of challenges we're seeing in culture and against the church? I've shared a bunch of these the last several weeks in our series on renewing the vision of UPPC, but I'm so proud of our session for leaning into that generative side of leadership. This is graduate-level leadership. 
And I'm proud to serve alongside these elders. I'm so thankful that we have discerned our focus statement that is beautifully expressed in your bulletin, which serves as a fan, by the way. But uh, uh, this is a, a, a picture for you. By the way, this is meant to go home so you could put this somewhere to remind yourself of what you belong to when you're unified in the body of Christ here at UPC. This is just a, a visual picture of what God has called us to. It has a little map that's pointing towards kind of where UPC is at in Tacoma and the concentric circles. We've talked a lot about what it means to reach the 80,000 people uh, in our five-mile radius. That's our sweet spot. Of course, we're always going to reach people outside of that five-mile radius, but this is kind of the sweet spot for us as a congregation. And for you to be reminded of this fourfold uh, distinction of our love, to be local, intentional, spontaneous, and tangible. It's a list. Nobody got that. That's okay. L-I-S-T. It's a list. Okay. I'll move on. <laughs> Some people are just getting it awkward. <laughs> yeah. Friends, I'm excited. This is something you can put on your, your refrigerator or maybe it's in your Bible. Maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, on the coffee table. And it can be something that you can talk about with friends that come over. But, but it's a visible reminder for you to take with you. and something we give to those who are guests to UPC. Our next task as a session is very clear. It's to discern with you as a congregation what three to four strategic initiatives we're going to be engaging in to, to collectively reach the 80,000 people that don't have a faith that are in our context. That is the next, next task of our session. And I want you to be prepared for that work this coming year and participate in it. With that in mind, I want to close with one such story. Uh, my friend Randy Downs and, and her children became a part of our congregation just this last year. And Randy, I want to invite you to come forward. And um, I've asked her to share just a little bit on how she came into the life of this church. And this, this is, this is, is, is this kind of nervous a little bit? Being in front of people? Yeah. A little bit? Okay. A lot. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of Randy. And Randy has made her way into our, our congregation in a very interesting way. And I uh, want you to share that, Randy. How did you come to UPC? How was it that you came to know this community of faith? Um, in two instances. The first instance, Kristen Brubaker. Um, her daughter, Ella, plays soccer with my oldest daughter, Rhiannon. And she had sent out an email inviting all of the new sixth graders to start um, attending Foundation on Wednesday nights, that youth group. Yeah. And then the second instance was um, my good friend Lynn Dixon invited my girls to participate in VBS last summer. Okay. So, Randy. Great. Randy, uh, if you haven't noticed uh, or haven't gathered, fits some of the demographics we're talking about that we're, we've kind of struggled to reach. Uh, Randy, you're in your early 30s. I don't want to let that out of the bag, but I just did. Okay. You're very youthful. Sir. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, but you have two children, 7 and 13. Yes. Our average, remember the average age, uh, most predominant age in our uh, community is the age of what? 10, right? You guys listen. I love it. Yeah. They're listening to me. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing. But, Good job. but tell us a little bit. How did, first of all, I, I want to get to just what your suggestion would be. T- for UPC, reaching people like you, because you've come into this church, come to know the love of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I'd love to know what your thoughts about that. But first, what was your experience of, of receiving and coming to know the love of Jesus in this church? Um, <clears throat> sorry. My girls and I had um, attended several different churches over the years, and I hadn't really found one that felt, um, I guess, it, that didn't meet the vision of what I felt the love of Christ is which is all-encompassing, all-inclusive, welcoming, warm, uh, a sense of family. And um, when my girls and I started attending here, it was just nothing but love and open arms and warmth and a definite sense of family and community. Yeah, it's fine. Um, Everyone just was just full of love and light. There was not an ounce of hate or cruelty or inconsistence with um, what I had thought the love of Christ was. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, hey, high five. (laughs) High five. That's the vision. That's the vision, right, friends? 
80,000 people who don't know the love of Jesus in a tangible way. Maybe they have perceptions of the church. I think that's beautiful, Randy. Thank you. What would be your wisdom to us? Because you're here part of UPC a little over a year now, right? What would be your wisdom to us that long to, to reach people that are in the life stage that you're in? Um, yeah. Just continue being kind and making gentle invitations that include families that make people feel welcome. Um, just keep being loving. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Can we give Randy a hand? Well, thank you. Stay, stay here for a second. I, I love that it's a, it's a gentle invitation. What a beautiful phrase. A gentle invitation by Kristen and Lynn. And that's all it takes, friends, is people want to know the love of God. They want to know love. And how do we be the hands and feet uh, of Jesus to those in our context? Randy, I'd love to just pray for you and then also just pray to close. So, friends, let us pray. Lord, thank you once again for a reminder that we actually, we're getting something right. That people like Randy and her kids can know your love in a very tangible and real way. In a powerful way. To be a part of a family that you have created here in this church. Thank you for her story. I pray that it inspires other stories like it. And we see a lot of folks who come in to our doors and become a part of the life of this church because of the love that we embody. Help us to embody that in greater and greater ways, not just in this church, but in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, our schools, our circle of friendships. Lord, help us to be your love, local, intentional, spontaneous, tangible. And we pray this in your holy name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Thank you.